Good afternoon. Attorney Protective would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Surviving a Cyber Attack, Protecting Your Firm During Lockdowns and Normal Operations. And with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Ernie. Thanks, Aaron, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, we're here today to talk about why law firms are our target and why do threat actors, as we call them in, in our line of work, um, really have been active in this space for the past couple of years. And there's a couple of different reasons, but first and foremost, you know, let's discuss are your secrets safe and why are folks out to get you? So looking at the outline, we're going to go through um, why exactly law firms are targets for cybersecurity attacks. Uh, we're going to get into specifics with regard to, you know, that proprietary information that everyone works on every single day and the non-proprietary information that the threat actors also look to gain through different types of attacks. Um, we're going to talk about the most common cybersecurity attacks that we've seen. Um, John and I, you know, I, I think John will agree with me as, as we move through the presentation that the focus on law firms has grown significant over the past few years. And we're going to get into that. And this is what John and I do every day. And we have a ton of war stories that we can share with the group as we proceed throughout the presentation. We're also going to touch on the ethical rules that are out there. Um, it's been pretty clear recently, especially through the ABA, that cybersecurity is a growing concern. And it's a growing concern for the industry. It's a growing concern um, from a corporate perspective. It's a, it's a growing concern from a regulatory perspective. And I I don't think there's an area of industry in the country or even the world now that hasn't become concerned about relevant cybersecurity in the day-to-day -day operations of their business. So we're going to talk about what ethics, ethical rules are out there. Uh, we're going to talk about confidentiality, and specifically, we're going to talk about uh, the more recent ABA opinions from 480 and 483. And then we're going to move into essentially what your law firms can do to protect themselves um, from cyber breaches and cyber risks. Uh, that will touch squarely on, you know, practices. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, business email compromises, phishing attacks, what you can do to protect yourselves from that, be it audits, um, employee training, things of that nature. And then we're going to move into, and John's going to take off with the ransomware issues that we see every day. Ransomware being the most problematic of all of the cyber attacks that we deal with, because not only does it have the ability to completely shut down your firm, it also causes major business interruption and can cost a lot of money, which John will talk about. We'll talk about how your firms respond to a ransomware attack. We'll we're gonna talk about timelines, considerations uh, with regard to ransom payments, how ransom payments are made and why they are made. And we're going to talk about the business decisions that go along with whether or not to actually pay a ransom and why you would pay it. So if we kick off Secret Safe, talk about why is it that law firms are – and there's a great line if anyone's ever seen The Devil's Advocate with Keanu Reeves and Al Pacino. Al Pacino's asked why he gets into the law – profession as the devil and entering the real world. And Al Pacino's response was, because it puts us into everything. And that's exactly why threat actors are seeking to shut down law, for, law firms and extort information from them and really lock down their entire business process. Because the desired information that they are seeking comes with less cybersecurity that we've seen on the law firm front. Now, the value of information that's out there, and that ranges from everyone that's doing proprietary work with regard to mergers and acquisitions, all the way down to those that are doing personal injury and collecting medical records, everything has a value on the dark web. And that's what they're seeking. They're seeking to, if they're going to go after things like personally identifiable information or protected health information that we typically see in our tip in our usual cyber breach that has value but most importantly they want that corporate information they want that information that has to remain non-public 
And there's a concern for release of that information, obviously from a legal perspective, and that's gonna have greater worth. And because of that greater worth, law firms are now seriously being targeted. Now, how are we targeted? Law firms, I mean, we see a lot of malware. We see a lot of phishing attacks. Um, we see brute force attacks. We see email spoofing. We'll see um, criminals, obviously, with ransomware attacks that are not only shutting you down, but will seek to threaten to what we call a lock and leak. And John will talk about that, where they threaten to leak your data if a ransom is not paid within a specific time frame. Uh, so a couple of things I just want to kind of bring out quickly before we move on to common cybersecurity attacks. Just two quick things from the ABA recent survey, survey on cybersecurity. Last year, 26% of all law firms experienced some type of breach. And there's an interesting caveat to that, that 19% of those law firms didn't even know what the cause was of their breach. Or as we say, what was the incident of compromise or how the bad actor got in. And 66% of those breaches were caused by outside vendors. And we could have an entire different seminar on the importance of making sure that outside vendors are vetted. And when I say vetted, it's so important for law firms in dealing with those that are gonna handle their data or have access to their network, that there has to be some type of contractual responsibility there to either shift liability or be able to audit that third party vendor with regard to their cybersecurity practices. Because I bet you, and I agree with that statistic of 66%, I bet it's even higher in some of the cases we've seen where the vendor was the cause of the exploitation. So that's just something I, I just wanted to bring up on the side because it's often overlooked, especially by law firms. So if we're looking at common cybersecurity attacks, you know, we're talking about email wire fraud scams are big with regard to those doing trust in the states. Uh, we have one right now with regard to a firm out on the West Coast where uh, they have suffered an incident where an employee clicked on a phishing email and after clicking on the phishing email, all of the credentials for that particular network were harvested. And when that happened, the threat actor had complete access to the entire network. Now that is going to become problematic because then they can see inside all of the communications that the law firm is having with their clients. And therefore they can then create fake emails, create those emails asking for a change in payment method, which is something that we see very often. And that can be avoided by secondary verification, things of that nature. But the problem is, once the threat actor has harvested the credentials of those that are working on daily files, um, the extent of the phishing could be much more extensive. And without appropriate training, that phishing email can be, and it can result in hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of losses. And I, I bet you probably the average loss we see in wire fraud scams is easily over a quarter of a million dollars. So and hey, Ernie, I'm gonna jump in here. Everyone, it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's John Loyal as well. I just wanna jump in and make a point here, which runs to the importance of, you know, the number one piece of guidance we can provide on email phishing, other than multi-factor authentication that we'll get into in a second, is making sure that you are verifying every single change in wire instructions that you are being provided. So if you are typically paying an expert or, uh, or your, uh, you know, your third-party, uh, any other third-party vendor, insurance carrier, anybody that you're dealing with, and you receive an email that says, hey, we have recently updated our bank, and here are our new wire-changing instructions before any payment is made. The best piece of advice we can give you is to pick up the phone and call the person who is your typical contact at that company and say, hey, we just received this email from, from you or someone within your organization. You're changing your bank over from Wells Fargo to Capital One or whatever it may be. Is this you and is this correct? Okay, 
because that is really the only way to accurately verify. Otherwise, wire fraud is a multi-million, if not a billion dollar industry. So it's as simple as picking up the phone to ensure that that money is not going to somewhere that it shouldn't be going. Thanks, Ernie. I just wanted to jump in on that. Yeah, thanks, John. And talking about social engineering fraud, it's pretty much almost the same thing. You know, it, it's issues where you're clicking on suspicious links or attachments, which again leads to credential harvesting, which allows the threat actor to gain access to your network. And we can tell you that when you're dealing with ransomware claims or you're dealing with specifics uh, regarding money transfers, bad guys know exactly what's out there. It's like a quick hit and run. Some of them are, don't get me wrong, but a lot of these threat actors do their homework. They do their homework to such an extent that a lot of them know exactly what your insurance policy proceeds are. So, you know, keep that in mind when you're thinking about should I do any further training with our employees because social engineering and email wire fraud are really, really prevalent in the industry right now. And especially around tax time, things of that nature, we see a big uptick in that. And the information that they're looking to hold for ransom, you know, is, is a concern for law firms. You know, and the, again, the threat actors know of the concern of the release of that information, which drives the price up with regard to certain cyber incidents. So let's talk a little bit about the ethics that are related to cybersecurity. So if we look at the ethical rules that are out there, we're all familiar with the, the duty of competent representation under the model rule 1.1. So I'm not really gonna go through that. Um, everyone on this call understands the necessity of that. The duty of confidentiality, again, I think everyone on this call understands you know, what's required in that attorney-client relationship. And the ABA has, has gotten more aggressive and, and taken a kind of a harder stance, if you will, with regard to your obligations when transferring electronic information. And that we see in formal opinion 480, which discusses the confidentiality obligations of lawyers and public commentary. And that kind of incorporation with, with 1.1 created and forced the ABA to author the opinion under 483. Now, ABA formal opinion 483 is another subject that we often have to address with our law firm clients because that talks about your obligations in the cyber context. So just as an example, under 483, every lawyer has a duty of confidence, which means in the cyberspace that when you represent your client, you have to make sure that you have adequate security measures that have to be taken to safeguard your technology. 483 also mentions that you have an obligation to monitor, which means that you have to reasonably, which is a great word for lawyers, right, because it's got, it's so broad, reasonably and continuously assess their systems and their standard operating procedures for technology and technology transmission, and that you have a duty to stop a breach, meaning if you suspect that a breach occurred, you have to take reasonable steps to stop the attack and prevent any further exposure of data. And lastly, and this is a question we get a lot from our law firm clients is, you know, what's required under the notice of breach? And pursuant to the ethical rules, and this comes back to us, and, and trust me, as breach coaches, we're, we're not sitting here worried about and espousing ethical obligations on behalf of everyone. We're out here to just give you the framework so you can make a reasonable business decision in communications with your clients. But, you know, if there is a breach and it is detected, you have to timely and reasonably notify your client, clients. And that's where the law firm back to us to make that determination as to when that should occur. And that's a whole other issue in terms of when to make that determination as to notify. So yes, there's an ethical obligation to do it, but there's also a timing perspective from a legal standpoint, meaning you can't notify if we don't know all the facts. And every state and every regulatory body that's overseeing privacy laws 
give us a period of due diligence where we are permitted to investigate and investigate thoroughly into what actually occurred and how it happened and who are those that are primarily affected. And if they are affected, what type of data was either taken or exfiltrated or was unauthorized or suffered unauthorized access. If that's the case, then it comes back to us to make a decision under what particular statute is there a duty to notify. So you're going to satisfy your ethical rule by complying, obviously, with the notification obligations. But I will tell you, we've seen a lot of our law firm clients go into a panic that they've got to tell their clients right away. And if it's, if it's not us telling them, slow down, pump the brakes, let's talk about the notification process, you know, sometimes it's also law enforcement because if there's an active investigation, they're going to tell you you can't notify yet because we're on the heels of catching the bad actor. So it all, again, it all comes down to tech competency and having some type of knowledge with regard to it and safeguards in place. So what can your law firm do to protect itself? Well, the first thing we always say is you've got to cultivate a, a security culture. Now, what the heck does that mean? So what we recommend on the front end is basic training. You know, lawyers a lot of times want to look at the back end, right? And that's kind of the third bullet point on this slide. You know, we, we worry about what's our exposure from a liability standpoint. And if we do have liability, what's the financial impact? You know, what's the, what are the damages associated with that liability exposure? Well, we can avoid all that if we're proactive on front. You know, if we're proactive rather than reactive, which we hear a lot in the cyber world, a lot of these could have been prevented. Now, I hate the, you know, it's not if but when statement, but it is in fact true that you could have the best cybersecurity in the world and the bad guys are going to figure out how to get, get in there. And if those bad actors get in there, you know, we got to figure out why and what could have been done to prevent it. Because those are a lot of questions that are presented that we need to answer, not only for those that are affected, that are due notification, but also to the regulatory and law enforcement authorities. So that security culture all, all starts with an audit. What is part of the audit? So the audit is you want to create essentially an inventory of all of the technology that you have in your environment. Then you move on to employee training. You know, so they have an understanding, and this is what John kind of touched on earlier. You know, so they know, you know, how to recognize suspicious links. You know, they get to recognize phishing and social on, social engineering. You know, that social culture goes back to the point I raised earlier as well with regard to a, a review of your contractual relationships with vendors and partners. You know, and then with your IT department. You know, you're going to work with your IT department to figure out and prepare an incident response plan that we see on the fourth bullet point. That is the most key document piece of weaponry that you can have in your arsenal to protect yourself against a cyber attack. And with regard to that incident response plan, you know, we break it down into five main things. It's detection. How do you detect it? The next one is containment. The next one is investigation. The next is remediation and then recovery. And if your RIP can detect that and you're doing tabletop exercise and things of that nature, you will see that when you do suffer a cyber incident, that you're going to be much better positioned to react and respond. Because if it's, if it's a ransomware claim, you know, John will talk to you about it, but the 72 hours, the first 72 hours of a ransomware claim are really, really tough because not only are we dealing with everything from a forensic standpoint and trying to get the business back up and running, but we're also managing personalities. So not only are we playing lawyer, but we're also playing psychologist for a lot of our clients. And right, and, and Ernie, just to add an add to on to that, yeah, just to add on to that too, with respect to the incident response plan, you know, another huge takeaway today is go back right, and take a review of, if you have one, your cyber policy and how does that, right, how does that interact with your incident response plan, right? Everyone's takeaway should, from this call today should be, if I suffered a, an email phishing attack, 
or if I suffered a ransomware attack, what is my next step going to be? And for those with cyber insurance, typically that first step is going to be either calling your insurance broker or calling you know, your, uh, the, the toll-free hotline number that most insurance carriers provide nowadays to provide 24-7 assistance, right? And then we've taken that a step further, right? Have you taken a look at, at the panel that, that that insurance company provides? You know, what, have you taken a look at the law firms that are entitled uh, for, for use? Have you taken a look at any of the forensic companies that could be utilized, right? So have those conversations with your IT department and say, hey, we have insurance with the XYZ insurance company. Here are the five or six panel providers that provide forensics. Are you aware of any of these companies? Have you worked with any of these companies in the past? Do you have any familiarity with them, right? Because when an incident happens, right, things are going to start moving very quickly. So if you can say to the carrier, you know, we vetted the panel, we, you know, we feel comfortable using X law firm and Y forensic firm, right, then you're already, you know, a few hours ahead of the game because you're already well prepared and you already have an idea as to who you're about to talk with and what they're about to do. Sorry, Arne, I just wanted to jump in with that. No, well said, John. And lastly, you know, depending on, and I think you should do this with every client, but the more proprietary and more sensitive the information that you're working with on a daily basis at your firm, you know, it doesn't hurt to discuss the cybersecurity aspect of client as well as your firm. So you can have open dialogue up front to understand, do we need to encrypt all transmissions going back and forth? And, you know, you want to make sure that protocol is in place so both sides understand that if there's any type of change in the transmission of data or payments, that there's a protocol to follow. So just having that open dialogue up front with clients, very helpful. So which takes us now to best practice tips. Now, we could have 10 slides here. But what I want to do is just, you know, these four bullet points kind of give you an idea uh, of some of the mainstays of best practices. But number one, the first thing I want to tell this entire group is make sure that those ha that have access to sensitive information in your firms have a pretty solid password, not password one, two, three. You know, we want to be able to, from a cybersecurity perspective, if you were to test passwords, you want to be able to reject those that don't meet a, don't meet a minimum criteria. and you also want to require your employees to reset their passwords regularly. So, you know, every time, you know, I, you don't have to do it every week uh, or every month, but, you know, at least every six to eight weeks. And another issue we see, and we would recommend that people think about, is the use of role-based authorization. So not everyone needs to see the most proprietary or sensitive data in the firm. So grant the least amount of privilege access to those that don't need it. Just to narrow the scope of the threat actor's attack and their ability to get access to that information. The next one is what we mentioned a little bit earlier, is make sure that you implement multi-factor authentication. Um, I bet you every one of your cyber carriers is asking that now um, because we hear it on every forensics call when we initiate um, our response to an incident with particular clients. So you want to make sure that you have multi-factor authentication in place. Yeah, and, I think you know, we're being kind by one. using the word consider. I think we're being kind using the word consider on the slide. No, I, I'll say it yeah. right here right now. It's that you should, there's absolutely no reason why nobody on this call, why there's someone that's working within an organization that does not have multi-factor authentication in place. It is a very inexpensive tool. It is very easily, uh, easy for your IT department to implement, okay? The only downside may be having to utilize your phone or some token or however it's going to be designed for, for that second step authentication, okay? But that, you know, the hassle of saying, well, I, I don't want to be able to use my phone, I can promise you when an incident happens, you're going to come back and say, man, I just wish that, you know, I took away that little inconvenience because now, you know, I'm really down a river, right? So. I, you know, there's no reason why anyone should be, after this call, if you do not have it, go to your IT department immediately and say, what steps do we need to take to make sure that every single person within our organization has multi-factor authentication enabled on their account? Yep, and two, the last two items I just want to raise before I hand it over to John is, 
train your employees on cybersecurity. You know, provide that training about email security, phishing, and social engineering. You know, you can always send out a decoy email with a suspicious link to see those who click on it. You know, we recommend that, and we see our clients do that a lot to see who are those in the organization or the firm who are more than who are more likely to click on a suspicious link. And lastly, for data, encrypt data if it's sensitive. If you're going to transmit data, you know, make sure it's encrypted. You know, you can use an SSL or a TSL protocol um, for, for the encryption of data. And also, make sure on all devices, because we see a lot of incidents re re um, regarding lost laptops. You know, you can enable full disk encryption on all devices to protect your data if it's stolen. Because if that is encrypted, that does give you a safe harbor in a lot of the state statutes with regard to notification that kind of ends the investigation right there. So just a few quick practice tips. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to John so he can tackle ransomware. Yeah, thanks, Ernie. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to just do a, take some time out here and do a deep dive into, into some ransomware. And as Ernie indicated at the beginning of the call, it's probably one of our most problematic cyber incidences that any organization or any law firm can face. Um, uh, the slide you're seeing here, this is a copy of a ransomware note, okay? And this is the start of what I'm going to call a really bad day for any organization, okay? Um, un unfortunately, right, you know, I've been in the cyber industry now for, for close to seven years now, which makes me ancient in this industry. Um, and when I first started, ransomware was what I'm going to call a nuisance. We saw very little attacks and the monetary demands were relatively small, okay? Starting within about the 2017, 2018 date range is when we started seeing a lot more activity, higher volume, higher types of demands, okay? This is when organizations really first started learning about ransomware and really starting to understand what they need to do to protect their organization, right? Um, over the two years after that, starting to go into the 2019-2020 range is when we really saw ransomware start to take off to where it is today, right? We've now seen dozens upon dozens of what I'll call different threat actor groups, okay? Demands that first started back in, the, uh, back in 2015 that were somewhere between 10 and maybe upwards of $50,000 are now typically in the mid six figures well into the seven-figure range, okay? Threat actors now, as Ernie indicated, the term lock and leak ransomware, what that means is now threat actors are not only shutting down your systems, okay, but before they hit the button to shut you down, they are trying to exfiltrate as much sensitive and personal information that they can in order to induce you or use another PowerPoint or pivot point to try to get you to pay a ransom, right? As ransomware has become more pro proliferant, right, more organizations are doing what they need to do from a backup perspective in order to recover, right? As the threat actors have seen their bottom lines drop a little bit because of that, right, they've now used another tactic, this tactic of exfiltrating information as another way to induce organizations or scare organizations into paying the ransom. Um, so what you, what everybody here probably knows about in the news, right, the, the pipeline, right, the meat processor, right, those are what's making mainstream media. Um, Ernie and I and our team, we're dealing with at least one to two ransomware attacks a day on a seven, seven day a week basis, 365 days a year, with the holidays specifically being some of the worst times. So going into next week, I expect our my team to be very busy through through Thanksgiving and then through the Christmas holidays over Fourth of July. For those who were tracking the news, there was a major systemic ransomware incident that affected uh, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of companies. Right? We I, I still don't think as an industry we have an idea as to how significant that attack was. Right? And so we are expecting a major uptick, especially over the next month or so as we head into the holiday season. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, for what is ransomware? So, essentially, ransomware is what I'm going to call a type of malware, a type of virus, a type of, 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 of Trojan horse, okay? Mm -hmm. And essentially, it can get introduced into the system through a myriad of ways, 
right? Sometimes it's something as simple as you have an open port for those that might be more technically astute on this call, but an open port, some, some system that is open to the internet that somebody who has a, a certain level of, of expertise is actually able to kind of brute force their way and walk their way in through this open port and essentially drop the, the payload malware. Um, another common tactic going back to the email phishing already discussed earlier in the call is as simple as, you know, a, an individual within your organization clicking on a link and that in and of itself installs the ransomware payload, okay? And as I said, right, the purpose of the ransomware is really to, if say you are a, a, a manufacturer, right, and you make widgets, right, the purpose of the, of the malware is to prevent you from now making widgets. As a law firm, the purpose of the ransomware is to prevent you from billing your hours and communicating with your clients in order to induce you to pay the ransom, okay? Um, we're gonna get into ransom demands and, and all that in, in a few minutes. Uh, but typically, you're going to hear the word cryptocurrency and Bitcoin uh, a whole lot today during the call. Obviously, everyone's become a lot more familiar with Bitcoin over the last couple of years. Um, but most threat, actors, most threat actors nowadays are only dealing with the cryptocurrency. I'd say upwards of 95% of it's in Bitcoin. Um, others, Monero, uh, Monero and, and, and Ethereum are some other examples as well, which are not as, as, as commonly used. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so let's say that your organization does fall subject to a ransomware attack. Well, what is at stake? First, financial, right? Ransomware attacks are going to be very expensive to any organization, okay? First is that you're going to have what I'm going to call your hard costs, right? You're going to be bringing in your breach response team that is not very cheap. So you're going to have legal involved, right? Your privacy counsel, folks such as, uh, as Ernie and myself, right? Then you're going to bring in your forensic firm, right? This is the company that's going to be able to do the down and dirty investigation that's going to be able to tell us exactly how did the bad guys get in, what did they do, okay? And where did they go, right? That is going to give us the visibility into the attack that's going to A, help us understand what we need to do to harden our system so this doesn't happen again, and B, to give us a better idea as to what information and what data may be at risk, okay? So those are just the hard costs, right? And then potentially dealing with notification costs, right? Um, PR costs, right? So those are just the hard costs of bringing in individuals. And then of course, any outside IT that we may need to bring in as well to actually help recover from the incident, okay? Then we've got potentially having to pay a ransom, which as I indicated, you know, the typical average ransom rate demand is now well into the six figures. And it's very routine, especially for if you're a larger law firm, I would expect that dem initial demand to at least be well into the seven figures, okay? And then your business interruption, your income loss, right? We have a lawyer that got sent, uh, that are sitting around at home, unable to bill hours, can't access client data, right? What is the income loss to that law firm, to that organization? Okay, um, the legal side of things, right? Obviously, as Ernie indicated, right, if we're dealing with client data, we're dealing with personal information, right? What are our obligations on the legal side of the house? And finally, reputation, right, PR, right? Now, I'm gonna tell you, right, being hit with a ransomware attack three years ago and going public with that, I would say was probably more of a PR hit as it is today, right, as ransomware is getting more picked up in the mainstream media and it's become a real significant discussion point with the folks down in Washington, right? So for those who are maybe concerned as to PR and have PR dictate a lot of their decisions, well, you know, I, I think, you know, fortunately, I think the public has become a lot more desensitized. Now, right, there's going to be the, the PR aspect of, of how do we communicate with our clients and what is our messaging going to be, right? And that should be a concern of the organization. But, you know, I, I don't want everyone to think that if you get hit with a ransomware attack today, that this is necessarily going to be the end of your business. I think the, the stigma around ransomware is, is out there. The public's becoming well-versed. Well and I think the attitude of what we're hearing now from, from not only our clients, but, but their vendors and, and their clients is, well, I guess this is just the world that we live in today. Okay. Um, next slide. So what are the costs, right? I'll, I'll quickly go through this one. But as I indicated, some of the most typical costs you're going to see uh, with the ransomware attack, forensics being the most expensive, right? Um, and then if we're in a situation where we're dealing with notification uh, of individuals and providing credit monitoring, 
you're going to see some, some significant costs uh, there as well. So you're going to, I can promise you that any type of ransomware incident is going to be a costly proposition, which really runs to the importance of having a cyber insurance, a cyber insurance policy uh, in place uh, to, pr to, protect and, uh, to protect against uh, these costs. Because I would say, typically, uh, most of these costs we would see covered under your um, standard uh, cyber insurance policy. Uh, next slide. All right, so that's now let's say our law firm has been hit with a ransomware attack, okay? How are we dealing with the initial response? What are the first couple consideration points, you know, we need to walk through, okay? The first is going to be let's access, you know, our operations, you know, with our internal folks with our internal IT. Can we get a quick idea as to what systems have been impacted, right? Is our, has our server that contains all of our data, our, our file server, has that been impacted? Can we still access most of our client files? Our accounting, our billing, right? If, if you, you're using some type of e-billing platform, can we still, you know, get onto those systems, right? So, you know, the first is taking the, the first couple hours of the attack and having a team essentially triage, right? If we have 50 servers, how many of these are, if 50 servers and 50 workstations, how many of these are impacted? What can employees, can they, can they, can they do and what can they not do, they do because of this attack, okay? The second is going to be backups, okay? So you heard me before go in my soapbox about multi-factor authentication. Well, here's my second soapbox of the day, backups, okay? Every organization at this point who is on this call, you need to understand from your IT department what is the current status of our backup, okay? Now, there are, going to, I mean, there are really two main types of backups that I'm going to point out on the call that I'm going to keep from a very high level, okay? The first is what I'm going to call your online backups, okay? These are backups that are essentially stored on your servers that are on the same network as everything else, as all your client data, as your, as your accounting platforms, right? It's pretty accessible and easy to get to. I can promise you that when the threat actor gets into your environment, the first thing that they are looking for are your backups. And they will be the first thing that is encrypted once the bad guy hits the button to shut you down. So if you, say, if you talk to your IT department and you, they say, yeah, well, we've got full viable backups, they're online, right, they're very easily to get to, right, the answer to the IT department is, well, what would happen if a threat actor encrypted our backups right now, would we still be able to restore from these, right? That answer is likely going to be no, okay? So I'm going to stress then the second type of backup, which is called what I'm gonna call the offline backup, which is something that's in a cloud or some other backup device that is not connected to your environment, right? So the threat actor, once they get in your system, cannot very easily get into this offline backup environment. That is where these backups need to be, segregated and away from your main network, okay? And number three is, let's consider the value of the encrypted data, right? They hit systems A, B, and C, right? But they didn't hit mission critical servers D, E, and F, okay? The question then becomes, can we survive without ever having or getting back the information that's stored on A, B, and C since we still have everything that we will consider mission critical on D, E, and F, okay? Because that will kind of frame what your next, these three factors right here are going to frame what your next 24 to 72 hours are going to look like. Uh, next slide. All right, so we're now hit with this ransomware attack, right? We're starting to walk through these first three factors that I just discussed, right? What is the first phone call you should be making, okay? That first phone call, like I said at the beginning of the call, for all, everyone who has cyber insurance that's on this call, or for anyone that doesn't get it and is and thinking about getting it, okay, your first call should either be to your insurance broker or if your policy has what I'm going to call a 24-7-365 hotline number, which a lot of insurance policies do have in place nowadays, to call that number, okay? When you call that number, you are typically either going to get in contact with the insurance carrier themselves who's going to provide you with immediate assistance, or those calls may get routed directly 
to a breach counsel or law firm that is approved by your insurance carrier, and you will be speaking to that attorney's law firm immediately, okay? At that point, once you have an opportunity to speak with that breach counsel, okay, that breach counsel will now set up the immediate next steps required in order to immediately start mitigating. So it is uh, someone like Ernie and myself, when we handle these initial calls, uh, we'll refer to ourselves as what I want to call the quarterback of the breach response, okay? So this is what we do for a living. We're going to take your hand and we're going to get you through it, okay? And we are going to bring the resources to you that are approved under your insurance policy in order to start mitigating and responding and acting as quickly as possible. And finally, um, and John, uh, based upon, yes, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, John, I was just gonna say, one of the key things here for everyone on this seminar to realize is the reason Privacy Council gets involved early is that not only are we gonna quarterback the investigation, but we're cloaking the investigation under attorney-client privilege. So if anyone's familiar with the case law that's out there now with regard to accessing forensics report um, following a cyber event, it, the case law is split, but I will tell you, if you go out and hire your own forensics firm, or you have a forensics firm that's already been employed with your firm, and you've been use, utilizing them on a daily basis, in all likelihood, any work that they perform prior to our involvement, or in some cases even after our involvement, could may not be deemed privileged. So that's why it's important to engage privacy counsel at the outset. Sorry, John, just wanted to make that point. Yeah, no, that's a, Ernie, that's a, that's a fantastic point. I am actually just law enforcement, and based upon, you know, what, what industry you may be in, right, um, especially if you work, if you're a Department of Defense contractor, or you have other ties with the federal government, right, we're going to be making sure that we're contacting the FBI, Homeland Security, Department of Defense, uh, whoever that may be. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so key consideration responses, right? We've, we've, we've uh, started assessing our backups, right? Determining what systems may be impacted, right? We've now reached out to trigger our cyber insurance, right? What are some next key considerations then? First, we wanna consider how long is this going to take, okay? I am going to, if, if I am working with you, one of the first words out of my mouth is that this is going to be a marathon, not a sprint. So if you are someone that is telling me this, this can't be happening to me, I need to be getting right back up right now. This is my busiest time of the year, okay? I'm going to uh, tell you in as nice as way possible that that's not going to happen in the next 24 hours, okay? And you need to be prepared to have an outage that's going to last for several days, okay? And we're all going to be working for the same common good, which is to get you back up and running as quickly as possible, right? Which is going to run to the importance of having a, a cyber incident response plan, a continuity plan, to be prepared if, if we can't access our systems for the next three to four days, you know, how are we still going to be able to interact with clients? How are we still going to be able to capture our billable time so we are, we're, you know, it's not affecting our bottom line as much as possible, okay? And based upon the factors I discussed before, the backups, with, with, with systems have been impacted, right, within the first 24 to 72 hours, we're going to start making some decisions as to whether or not we need to reach out to the threat actor and begin negotiating and ultimately culminating with the payment of a ransom. Next slide. All right, so then the question becomes, do we pay the ransom, okay? Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of factors that go into this, mm -hmm. okay? Now, ultimately, it is going to be a business decision for you and for you alone, okay? I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm the horse and, and I'm gonna lead you to the water, right? But at the end of the day, you know, there's only, I, I can't advise you as to whether or not it's, it's in the best position of the organization to pay the ransom, okay? Now, what are some of the factors that we're going to be looking at? One is going to be the viability of the backups, okay? Very simply, if you do not have viable backups, I'm going to tell you that there's probably a greater than 95% chance that we are ultimately going to have to go out, negotiate with the threat actor, and try to obtain the best deal that we can get uh, so everyone is comfortable with the payment that is being made, okay? Because if you don't have the backups, short of getting what I'm going to call the decryption tool or the decryption key, there is really no other way to recover, okay? We can try to reach out to the FBI, see if they have any tools or tactics or anything that they've uncovered with the specific group that we're dealing with, 
oftentimes that is unsuccessful, and we are really left with the Pandora's box situation of we are either going to um, lose years and years and years of, of clients' historical data and the like, or we're going to have to pay the ransom, okay? Number two is going to be, okay, what value do we put on some of the information stored in our systems, okay? When we reach out to the threat, if we reach out to the threat actor, one of the first things that we're going to receive is what's called a proof pack, which is a small sliver of information that they have taken. They're not going to show their whole hand and tell us everything that they've taken up front, okay? But through what I'll call that proof pack, it's going to give us a little more information as to where they've been and what they may have taken, right? So if you have, for instance, the trade secret of Coca-Cola stored on your system, I'm going to say you probably have a lot more financial incentive to pay as opposed to, right, having your child's math homework stored on your system, okay? Now, some of the other factors are, right, do I have certain NDAs in place? Do I have client confidentiality in place? Do I represent some famous figures where if this information got out? It could be very damaging uh, to the firm. Uh, you know, would it damage our corporate survival, right? So you really have to start thinking long and hard of thinking, you know, this is what the threat actor is showing us. There's a good potential they got here, and this is where X, Y, and Z is stored, and this could really damage the, our law firm, really damage our client if this information got out. And essentially, you're then putting a value on that paper and saying, you know, we're willing to pay X amount of dollars in order to ensure that this does not get out, okay? Because at the end of the day, as Ernie indicated on this call, right, when the threat actors take this information and you ultimately don't pay them, there is a very high risk that this information is going to be leaked onto the dark web. Most of these threat actors have what we call public leak sites or hall of shames that will show all of their victims who chose not to pay, and they essentially do a data dump of all the information that they took, okay? Next slide, please. So uh, this slide kind of just goes exactly what, what I went into here is, is you're going to have your encryption and then you're going to have potential, essentially encryption as well as data exfiltration, okay? So you're going to be, consideration of the ransom is going to be, do I need the key to recover my systems and do I need to make a payment in order to prevent the leak of sensitive information? Mm -hmm. uh, next slide. Okay, so now let's talk about the, let's get into the little weeds a little bit as to a ransom payment, okay? I've seen some questions, uh, I've seen some questions, and one, one of the things we always get is, well, is ransom payments legal, right? The FBI will say to us, right, uh, you hear the, the generality that they say, do not negotiate with terrorists, do not negotiate with crime syndicates, right? Um, uh, you know, that, but that in our cyber world, okay, is not necessarily true, okay? Making a ransom payment is legal as long as we are not in violation of what I'll call U.S. sanctions law, okay? So essentially, the U.S. government has placed certain countries, certain what I'll call ransomware threat actor groups on their banned list, okay? And Ernie and I and, and, and Privacy Council, who, who does this regularly, any firm that you're going to work with who's going to make a payment knows exactly who the banned actors are, okay? So as long as we determine through our investigation, through all available forensics, through the information provided to us by the bad guys, as long as we can confirm that they are not an entity on the U.S. sanctions list, okay, then we, will, we can go forward and make the payment and essentially the vendor who's making the payment will give us a certification that this payment, based upon all the information I just discussed, right, the totality of the circumstances, we have no reason to believe that we are making a payment to a sanctioned entity, okay? Um, if we define ourselves in a situation where we are determining that we need to pay a ransom, we will work with either a, a forensic firm who handles both forensics as well as negotiation, or reach out to certain third parties uh, who actually just solely specialize in cyber ransom negotiation, and we will work with those firms to handle the negotiation. They will physically go out onto the dark web, okay, and they will initiate communication with the threat actor. They will obtain our initial demand, and once we have that, you will work with your privacy counsel 
and your, your, your internal IT, your forensic firm, and determine you know, what are our steps in negotiation if we choose to pay, okay? Typically, right, most threats, say, let's say the initial demand is a million dollars. Typically, we would expect with most threat actor groups that we can negotiate that price down about 20 to close to 40%. You know, since the pipeline, I would say we've been able to do even better, right? I think we've been, been seeing where we can even get results 60 to 75% as these threat actor groups, right, are trying to get uh, some attention off of them and are really just trying to look to make a, a much quicker buck, okay? So just because the initial demand may be a million dollars, you're shaking your head, my God, my organization can't pay for that, I don't have cyber insurance, right? I typically take those numbers with a grain of salt, recognizing that I can probably get that number down, you know, somewhere in the 500000 to to $750,000 range, okay? Um, ultimately, how do the negotiations culminate, right, is that we will agree on a number. Let's say that number is ultimately $500,000, right? We will run all of our federal checks to make sure that we are not making a payment to a, to a banned threat actor group or, or organization. Once that check comes back clear, um, the threat actor provides us with their Bitcoin wallet, okay? And at that point, we are making the payment in typically cryptocurrency, which is usually Bitcoin, okay? Um, at that point, we make the payment. It goes into their wallet. And I, I've seen this in real time. You'll then see that wallet and the money in that wallet turn into 1,000 wallets, turn into 5,000 wallets. And now that money is spread all over, you know, the, the wallets of this threat actor group house uh, to make it as, much, as untraceable as possible, okay? Um, uh, next slide. I know we've only got a few more minutes here. Um, so one of the things that we always get, right, is I'm making a $500,000 payment, right? How do I know I'm going to get back the goods, right? So if I'm making a payment to get my decryption tool because I need it to unlock my system and I, want, and I don't want this information to get out onto the dark web, right, how do I know I'm paying it yet they're still going to leak all my client information? It's going to sound crazy to everyone on this call, but there is an honor amongst thieves, okay? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, these threat actor groups, especially the major ones, right, operate like major business organizations, okay? And in the end of the day, our industry is actually a pretty small industry. So if I'm paying, for instance, let's say the, the Conti threat actor group is one of the most prevalent ones right now, right? It's bad for business for Conti not to give us a decryption tool and not to give us an affirmative statement that our, that our data has been deleted, right? Because at the end of the day, if they go and they don't provide me the tool after I paid the half million dollars, the next time I'm advising my client, this is just what happened. And I'm going to tell my industry contacts, this is just what happened. So now everybody is on heightened alert and will consider, you know, what just happened in the past. So I would say our success rate, Ernie's and I's success rate of paying the ransom and getting back what I'll call the goods is probably close to 99%. Of course, we've always got you know, perhaps the, the 20 year old in his, in his bedroom that's operating some type of ransomware. He doesn't know what he's doing and, and, and it becomes an issue. But as long as we're operating with the major threat actor groups, I expect that we are going to get exactly what we paid for. Uh, next slide. Perfect. So then uh, very quickly, we pay the ransom. Uh, we get the ransom, we get the key, right? We're gonna give that key over to your IT department. They're gonna do some testing on it make sure it's clean of any suspicious malware, and then you're gonna be able to start using the key to encrypt. Everyone on this call, uh, this is not a magic wand, okay? So if you pay to get a ransom, I want everyone, you're not all, the lights all of a sudden are not going to turn on. It is still going to be you know, a process, depending on the speed of your system, depending on the amount of, of data that's been encrypted. It could take eight hours, it could take 80 hours, okay? So one of the business considerations of paying the ransom is to expect I am still going to be down, uh, there's a likelihood that I'm still going to be down for several more days while IT is working through the decryption tools and getting all my information back up and running, okay? Uh, and one more slide I think we got, and then we'll head into some Q&A, right? So finalizing the claim, right? I've paid the ransom, right? I've gotten back my data. What are the final next steps? At that point, just because we've paid a ransom, doesn't absolve us of our legal obligations, okay? The threat actor still had data in their possession and a letter of the law, that still means that there was unauthorized access, okay? So we still need to take the steps on our end to determine what did the threat actor have in their possession, okay? 
And then through that, we will work likely, depending on the size of the information, we will work with a third-party company who will review the information, determine what individuals, what information may have been impacted, and then based upon well, that deliverable, right, that's put together for us, we will determine what our notification requirements are. At that point, right, that's when we're making our client disclosures and we'll be making our regulatory disclosures as well, okay? And again, going back to what I said earlier in the call, getting a letter in the mail saying that my social security number or my credit card number or whatever it may be a couple of years ago, right, may have been something a little more sensitive for someone to receive. I think everyone on this call has probably now received multiple letters in their life, right, and for a large number of individuals, right, we're not just, they're not giving it the level of attention that they may have in the past because, you know, right, we become desensitized a bit to receiving these letters and, and understanding that a lot of our information through, you know, historical breaches and the like is probably out there and is most likely accessible, okay? Um, so with that being said, Erin, I think I'm going to pass it on over to you. We've got a few more minutes uh, for some Q&A. And John and Ernie, just so you know, we've had a lot of great comments about how your presentation has just been so informative. So thank you, because your knowledge and expertise in this area is so val valuable to the lawyers attending this CLE today. So with that, we have some questions coming in. Um, the first one is, is it illegal to make a ransom payment? The FBI says that we should not be negotiating with criminals or paying ransom demands. Yeah, and I think, I, Ernie, I'll take this one. I think I mentioned this on the call as well. Uh, it is not, while the FBI guidance, right, that is typically out there is, is not to pay or, or communicate or, or negotiate with, with terrorists or, in our case, threat actors, right, in our world, the FBI also recognizes that sometimes a company has no choice but to pay a ransom, okay? Um, the FBI knows what we do, right, knows the business that Ernie and I are in, the business that a lot of forensic providers are in, knows that these are people that specialize in making ransom payments, okay? If the U.S. government wanted to prevent us from making these payments, they, very, they could very easily put these threat actors on the, the sanctioned list that I was discussing earlier on the presentation. There are reasons why the U.S. government has chosen not to do that, right? Recognizing that a law firm's only ability to recover and to not lose years of historical data and not to shut down their doors is by paying the ransom, okay? But that means that you should also be working with a specialized team who knows how to do this and knows that the payment that you're making will not be running afoul under U.S. federal law. Great. Thanks so much, John. Another question that came in is, what are some best practice security measures to prevent against malicious activity? Well, I think we touched on that a little earlier. Um, you know, multi-factor authentication. I, I can't stress it, and I think John said the same thing. We can't stress MFA enough. Uh, it's, it's a must. As well as simple training. Training is, is so important. Um, tabletop exercises you know, running through your incident response plan, making sure everyone knows what their jobs are and what their duties are and their respective duties will make, you know, your response time, your restoration time, and your ability to get back up to full operations a lot quicker if that's all done ahead of time. Great. Thanks, Ernie. And as a reminder, we are at the 60-minute mark, so it is not necessary to remain on the line for the full Q&A in order to receive credit, although we um, have a few more questions that the presenters will be answering. The next one that came in is, how does the government intend to stop the ongoing threat of ransomware? Uh, yeah, you know, I think right now, you know, as I said in my previous comment, right, and I think people are aware of discussions that are going on in Washington, right? And I think there's kind of people on both sides of the, uh, of the platform, on those who are saying, well, you know, we shouldn't, we should ban ransom payments, right? We shouldn't be paying these bad guys. It's only, you know, fostering them to, to continue their illicit behavior, okay? On the other side of the coin is, what options do some companies have, right? And if there's a universal ban on ransom payments, right, I can promise you that those first couple hundred thousands of companies that are going to hit that need to pay a ransom to, in order to recover their data, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to help out those American businesses? Those businesses may fail, okay? So right now, I think that's why the government is not taking a position on whether or not, you know, on a universal ban of ransom payments. Again, if they wanted to do that, right, they can just sanction all the groups that we know we're making payments to. What the government is doing, though, 
is that I think they are trying to regulate our industry, especially through cyber insurance. So as some of you have insurance and you're going to be working through the renewal process over the next year or two years or whatever that's going to be, I can promise you that the cyber insurance carrier is going to be asking you more specific questions, such as, do you have MFA on your system? What is the current status of your backups? Do you have advanced threat detection tools that are called EDR tools and point detection and response? Do you have these more sophisticated tools on your environment to prevent against a ransomware? Right? Because I think they're going to at least try to regulate, have the insurance companies try to regulate the industry first before trying to make any more blanketed positions with respect to the legality or illegality of ransomware. Great. Thanks, John. Another question that came in is, as a law firm, do we have any heightened reporting requirements under the law? John, I'll, I'll, I'll jump on this one. I mean, um, no, as a law firm, you do not. Obviously, we, with regard to your ethical obligations, that has to be considered. But from a regulatory state law perspective, no. Um, you know, there could be some circumstances. Um, we're dealing with one right now in, in Michigan where um, a law firm was, was, was breached and they did a lot of insurance work. So there was some heightened obligations there to report um, the, the breach itself to the Department of Insurance. So absent some industry uh, specific standard or some contractual responsibility, um, there is no heightened duty um, from a regulatory perspective that, you know, would make us concerned that, oh, this is a law firm, we better get on this quickly. You know, a law firm is no different for us in, with regard to if it's a corporation or if it's, you know, a hospital. You know, we have to respond as quickly as possible, and our response triggers your ability to know what, when, and how that was affected and what your regulatory obligations are with regard to notification requirements. So it's governed by state and federal law, and there's nothing specific to individual law firms. Great. Thanks so much, Ernie. Another question is, how quickly do I need to notify if I think sensitive data was exposed? Uh, yeah, Ernie, I can I'll jump on that one and you can jump in too. It, it, it depends, right? So some information could be considered contractually based, okay? So it's always important if you know that you have certain contracts with vendors or with clients and it speaks to, you know, so there's some type of data breach provision that speaks to the disclosure of information and when you have to report, right, that, could, that provision could be immediately, it could say within five business days, right, it could be a shorter amount of time than that's defined by the law. Typically, if, we're just, if that contract does not exist, right, there are some states that will say you, you have a duty to notify 30 days once you're able to confirm and determine that individuals within that state are impacted. Some other states are, are a lot looser and say, you know, without unreasonable delay, which basically just means we need to really do it and have a showing that we've done our due diligence here. We haven't sat on our hands. We've continued to, to move the ball. We've done our forensic investigation. We thoroughly reviewed the information. We determined who was impacted, and then we moved as quickly as possible to notify. So um, typically 30 days is, is usually the, the magic number. Um, some states don't have that deadline. And then, of course, if there's anything contractually based that's sooner than 30 days, well, then we'll need to comply with whatever that contract says. Yeah, and then Great, also yeah. for anyone out – oh, sorry, Aaron. I was just going to say for anyone no, that's doing ahead, international Aaron. work, yeah, you have GDPR considerations. So, you know, there's a, there's a certain 72-hour time window there. But then again, that 72 hours doesn't really begin to tick until you have a full understanding as to – what exactly was exposed. So that goes back to that whole issue of due diligence and conducting that forensics uh, investigation in a reasonable time frame. Sorry, Eric. No, that's great. Thanks so much, both John and Ernie. Well, at this point, we are out of time for further questions. That concludes today's event. Certificates of attendance will be emailed to participants within one week. And on behalf of Attorney Protective, I would like to thank all of you for joining us for today's webinar. And I would also like to thank our speakers, Ernie and John. So thank you so much, and have a great day.